On the air everywhere, this is New England Broadcasting. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. It's the Ron Van Dam Show. Oh boy. Hold on tight, things can get a bit weird, if you like that sort of thing. Hey, welcome to the program. Here I am, I'm over here. I'm o- No, I'm over here. Hi. I woke up this morning, looked out the window, said to myself, what a lovely day this will be. By the time it's evening, I'll realize that wasn't necessarily the case. These are false hopes that one has when they wake up in them. Oh, it's going to be a wonderful day. I, I know people that are very optimistic about everything. Oh, this is going to be a great day. And uh, their voice even picks up a little bit when they say, it's going to be a great day. And they're going to have a wonderful day today. And by 5 or 6 o'clock, it's, well, that didn't work out very well. But what happens the next day they wake up again and it's, whoa, it's going to be a great day. And by 5 o'clock, nah, it wasn't a great day. When are you going to learn? Stop saying that in the morning. It doesn't do anything. Here's what you do. When you wake up in the morning, look in the mirror, which is going to suck because nobody looks good in the morning when they look in the mirror. Do that right away so you can see yourself at your absolute worst. Look in the mirror and say, oh, God, this day is going to suck. And by 5 or 6 o'clock, you'll probably say to yourself, well, it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. That's your optimism. Well, this show is going to suck. Uh, By the time the show is over, you'll say, Ron, that didn't suck. That was wonderful. See, that's how that works. (laughs) Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Hey, how are you? My God, give me a hug. Come here. Come here. Bring it in. Bring it in. There you go. Oh, oh, yeah, that was nice, huh? We don't hug enough. And you know what? That's because people smell. They don't shower enough. As a matter of fact, when I hug somebody and they don't smell, I actually say to them, well, you actually smell good. It doesn't mean that I think they smell good. It's that it's not as smelly as I thought they would be. Again, great expectations. Hugging is weird. I'm, I'm not good at hugging. I never was. My parents never told me how to hug. They, they, they talked about a lot of stuff, but they never explained hugging to me. So I had to figure it out for myself through various hugging methods. I'd walk through malls and stop people and say, will you hug me? I don't know how to do this. And they wouldn't. For some reason, they would not. They'd just continue on with their their little purchases and their packages. (laughs) I don't know how to hug. I don't. I think I got it down now. I think I got it down. I think uh, you wrap your arms around somebody and then you just wait and see what happens. Uh, I think that's what you do. Because hugs are, hugs are kind of fake in a way. Like you say hello with a hug, you say goodbye with a hug, and in between, not much going on. The hug is like uh, took the place of the handshake. But, you, but the hug has to be mutual. Two people have to extend their arms at exactly the same time. Otherwise, one of them is just hugging because you started it, and you can tell. <laughs> so don't 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 go for the fake hug. It means nothing. A hug is a like a, it's an embracing of two bodies. My God, that's extreme. It really is. It's a it's a sign of uh, affection. <laughs> I'm telling you something. Uh, here, here's what's awkward for me with the hug. Ron, are you going to talk about a hug like for 30 minutes? Is that what you're going to do? Because if you are, I'm just going to go out and get a sandwich and come back when you're finished. No, this is important. Listen to me because I think you should understand things. I, I never learned how long the hug should go. Um, 
I, I don't I don't know the, I don't know the timing on the hug. You you get involved in the hug, you're in the embrace, and you don't know you wait for somebody to break it up. And I, I don't want to be the one to say I've had enough of this. I don't want to do that. I leave it up to the other person to disengage from the hug. And some people just do a quick hug, you know, just like a and it's over. Other people like hold on like like they're treading water in an open ocean and if they let go they'll drown i i don't and i don't know how to i don't know how hard to hug i don't know sh- is, is this a body press or is this just like a hug but leave a space in between you know i don't i don't know i don't know. i leave it up to the other person and that's not good i want to be in charge of the hug but i don't know what to do with it and what do you say after a hug? Do you do you just make believe it never happened? Um, do you say something weird like, that was very physically enjoyable? No, you don't say that. You also don't say, Oof, that was awkward. I don't even know you. Why, why am I hugging? Some people are very huggy, like, like Joe Biden. Do you know who he is? Do you even follow the news? Do you even know who Joe Biden is? He was the vice president with Barack Obama. Do you remember that? Uh, I guess you were busy. I guess you were out of town. Joe Biden hugs a lot. It's not sexual at all. He just, he's a very affectionate person. How, how can you, you know, and then people complain, oh, Joe Biden hugged me. Oh my God. It's just, that was not called for. Put me in a very awkward position. Oh, just shut up. Just let him hug you and just get it over with. Stop it. He's not, he's not touching your pubes or anything. Leave him alone. Leave him alone. He's crossed into that uh, that realm of being old, and I and I hate to say that. And being old, believe me, in many cultures, being old, you're the wise person because you've been through everything in life. You are the wise one. We look up to you. We respect you. You are revered because you have that type of knowledge that you've acquired over the years. So, quote unquote, old people are to be, to be revered and respected and loved and treasured. Not, not, uh, well, you're old. You got a wrinkle, so I can't even, I can't deal with you. You have a wrinkle. That's awful. That's just awful because you're going to be old. I don't care who you are. You're going to be old too. So just shut your mouth about that old stuff. However, uh, when you reach a certain age, when you do quirky little things like that, people just excuse you and say, well, he's old. You know, what are you going to do? He's old. <laughs> It's like it's it's like senior citizen discounts. Should we charge him to for the donut? Now he's old. Give him the donut. What the hell? Guy's been through enough. Give him a donut. Give him ten percent off on the donut. <laughs> I love it. At some places, the senior discount is so negligible; it's almost like an insult. <laughs> it's like, yeah, how much is it uh, for the movie today? Uh, so it's twelve dollars. What's the senior discount? Eleven dollars and seventy-five cents. You get a discount of a quarter, of uh, not a quarter of the amount, like twenty-five cents. I'm talking about. Oh, thanks. That's a hell of a discount. <laughs> That's a, there's your senior discount right there. <laughs> How much is coffee today? Uh, coffee is uh, two dollars. What's the senior rate for the coffee today on senior uh, discount day? Oh, that's a dollar ninety five. Oh, a nickel. I'm saving a nickel. Thank you so much. Now I can eat. Now I can feed my cat. A nickel. Thank you. Thank you for revering me to that extent. Senior discount. They shouldn't have. Just let them in for free, damn it. The hell's your problem? No discount. I'm giving people a discount because they're old. <laughs> what? What is that? How about if you get a discount because you're halfway intelligent? How about that? Intelligent people get into the movies for for eleven dollars. Stupid people, that's twelve because you're stupid enough to pay the full price. Why don't we do that? <sighs> or Donald Trump, uh, he could probably say, "Yeah, you want to go to the movies? Uh, twelve dollars if you're uh, if you're white, and um, if you're uh, Mexican." Uh, $50, $50, how about that? Wow, 
Wow. Getting the white discount, huh? I mean, you know, seriously, and, and that's supposed to be a joke, by the way, although there's tinges of reality to that. <sighs> senior discount, man. People can't wait to be a senior and get all kinds of discounts. No, it's not worth it. <laughs> Believe me. Stay young. Don't become a senior. It ain't worth it. Believe me. Look at look at the poor old person. Oh, just let them in for free. Oh, give them a discount. Wow, I don't need your pity. Do you know you can be a member of the AARP, the Association, the American Association of uh, Retarded People? Is that what it is? Or retired? I'm sorry, retired people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think they've lowered the age for that. It's, I think it's like 55 now, or is it 50? You can be a member of a retired... Who retires at 50 years old? How can you be a member of, a, of an organization for retired people and you're only 50? Well, some people retire at 50. Yeah, who? Point them out. Point them out to me. What people have enough money to live well and retire and stop working at 50. Raise your hand. Oh, I don't see any hands going up at all. As a matter of fact, most people now are working until they're 65, 70 years old in the fields, uh, shucking corn. I mean, anyway, anyway, you still with me? <laughs> it's because that's the amazing part. I don't know. I don't know what the hell's going on anymore. I just don't know. Everything's weird. Everything's like upside down. Uh, do you know why I, I cherish my childhood? It's because, I've talked about this before, childhood, easy peasy, man. I didn't have to do a damn, I didn't even have to make decisions. My parents made them for me. You're going to school today. You're going to wear these pants and this shirt. When you get home from school, you are going to do your homework. I didn't have to make any decisions at all. What's for dinner? You're going to have the uh, the meatloaf. I I made no decisions at all. I none none. You're going to be home by ten o'clock. You're going to wake up at seven a.m. We're going to the to the grandparents' house. You're going to be nice for a change. <laughs> You're not going to complain about anything. I didn't have to decide anything, man, at all. It was sweet. I mean, I wanted my independence, and then when I got it, it was like, eh, it was not as good as I thought it was. I have to start making decisions. That's rough. That's a rough one, man. Then would tell me how to make a decision. You don't go to school. And there's a class in making decisions. They didn't have that. It was just math and history and other stuff that really didn't come into play. Why do they teach math at all anymore? What's the point? Who does that in their head? You take out your cell phone, you go to the app for the calculator, and you figure it out. You don't need that anymore. Who needs that? In English class... <laughs> I mean, teach me how to read and shut up. What, what the hell? Would, why are we making this a whole subject thing that goes on through all of my education? Teach me to read. If I choose to read, fine. I mean, what, what are we making this like the all big class about this? Why are you telling me which books to read? What? Teach me how to read, and I'll read. I'll read what I want. What is this about? What is that about? History, man. History. Ron, it's good to know your history. Okay, but I'm not using it a lot. Well, it's good to understand the present if you understand the past. No, I've been told not to look backwards. I've been told to only look to the future and don't let the past uh, guide you. Uh, leave it alone. It's all history. It's all behind you. Why are you teaching it to me then? Why are you teaching me something that you tell me not to regard, just to look forward, don't live in the past? Yet we have courses that live in the past. Come on, man. In English class, they taught me penmanship. Seriously? Seriously? No one uses penmanship anymore. 
We, we, we text things. We type things. We use letters that we choose with our fingers. We don't, we don't write things down. If, and if we do, it's in print. It mirrors the, the, the print that we're typing. Nobody has penmanship. Nobody signed. There's no thing. Just teach me how to write the letter A in script. Script? People don't even know what you're talking about anymore. Penmanship? When someone signs their name, you don't have to read it. It's just a signature. You can't make it out. Do you ever go to a doctor's office and they sign something? They're just scribbling shit on a line. They, they don't even know how to do it. They don't even sign prescriptions anymore because the pharmacy said, we can't read this crap. Actually, I take that back. That was the most amazing thing about pharmacies. When I was growing up, doctors wrote uh, uh, prescriptions, subscriptions, magazine subscriptions. They wrote prescriptions on little slips of paper. Then you brought that slip of paper to the pharmacia and the doctor would write down uh, the medication and sign their name. Um, <laughs> that was, uh, you know, that's how they did it. And you would bring the slip to the pharmacia and you would give it to the, uh, to the druggist there. We don't call them druggists anymore because drugs a bad word. No drug stores, no druggists. Uh, they're, um, pharmacists, pharmacists. I would give the slip to the pharmacist. The pharmacist would, and I keep thinking, oh, you're going to give me the wrong, uh, the wrong medicine because I can't read what this guy wrote. This doctor can't even write. Here's a doctor went to college like for 23 years to be a doctor. The damn guy can't write. They never taught him penmanship. Um, the, the pharmacist looks at it and goes, okay, that'll be ready in five minutes. I said, what will be ready in five minutes? How can you read that? Don't you have to call the doctor and, and ask the doctor what was written? To, no, no, I can, t I, I can see what the, how can you, what are you in some kind of code with these people? How can you read that? It's impossible. I can't even read the doctor's name. Well, it's Dr. Rabinowitz. Rabinowitz, how do you make that out of two little scribbles? I don't know. I can read it. Oh, I feel inadequate now. It's like I'm not a member of the, the code club here. That was amazing to me. Anyway, um... <laughs> You know, it's it's back to school time, which has nothing to do with kids going back to school. It has with you it has to do with you spending money for school supplies. That's what this is all about. That's what everything is all about. Labor Day sales, Christmas sales, New Year's uh, purchases. Uh, that's all. That's all it's about. You know, that's all. That's all. School supplies. I don't give a crap. What school supplies does a kid need? What school? If you don't have a pencil and a pen in a drawer somewhere in your house, then you're not human. Piece of paper, you can find that somewhere. Go to the dollar store, get him a notebook. What are we talking about? Well, my kid has to have school supplies and has to uh, look good in school. Why? Why? Do you know the dress code in a school now? The dress code is just pants. They, they, don't, they don't have dress codes anymore. Wear your tattoo somewhere where clothes will cover it. That's all they care about. Ugh. Come on. When I was going to school, girls had to wear skirts. What? Why? Why do girls need to wear... Well, now they can wear pants. Now you can wear jeans. I mean, seriously. What are we shopping for clothes for? The grungier the look, the more fashionable it is. What are, what are you doing? What, what are we doing? Everything changed. Everything changed. And I go back to my original conversation, which started about three hours ago. Childhood was so much easier. Your parents took care of everything. You actually believe that the government was incredibly intelligent, had all these secret agencies, so nothing can ever happen here. We have, the, we have a bubble of protection on top of this country and the smartest people on the planet work in the government. Oh my God, did I get that one wrong? If Donald Trump has taught me anything, it's that my image of this country and the way it takes care of you has been shot to every piece of hell you can possibly imagine. 
The government takes care of you. What? Gives you this blanket of security like there if some problem is as though we got the smartest people who are going to take care of it? No. I've seen the people in Congress. They're not that smart. As a matter of fact, the guy in the White House right now is trying to destroy the country for his own personal gain. He thinks he's the Messiah, the chosen one. Oh, I see. You put a nutcase in the White House. Didn't do it on purpose. Didn't have a choice. Wasn't much of a choice involved. When I went to school, they didn't teach me how to make decisions. There you go. All right, my guest is uh, coming up momentarily. We're going to talk about gun violence and how that can be um, well, possibly taken care of. I learned something because I did some research on this. I, I could not figure out why a citizen would want to have assault weapons in their home. Why do we not have a ban on assault weapons? They kill in mass numbers. Why would somebody need that, want that? Why should somebody have it? When they wrote the Constitution, all they had was muskets. It took you six hours to put new gunpowder in it. So what's that about? I read up on this. The reason that citizens in the Constitution, they believe, should have assault weapons is that the idea is that a citizen should be able to protect themselves from a rogue government. I see. I see. It's like the rogue government doesn't have assault weapons of its own and much larger numbers than you sitting in your house. That makes all the sense in the world. Well, Ron, it's in the Constitution. Oh, my God. Did I question the Constitution? Oh, my. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Did I do that in public out loud? Okay. Anyway, uh, we're going to see what we can do about this gun violence thing, and we'll do that uh, right after we take a, uh, well, you know, a breather. I mean, I need to breathe. I really do. I mean, the, this has just been going on way too long. And I think you need a little bit of a break, too. I don't know how much you can take. I really don't. You're pretty cool. You're pretty nice. I like you. Okay, Ron Van Dam may not be the prettiest face in radio. What? But come on. That voice? Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Oh. yeah. You are listening to Ron Van Dam, the sexiest voice in podcasting on New England Broadcasting. Thank you very much. Good morning. Rick Smith is joining us. He's the CEO and founder of Axon, who's the global leader of uh, connected technologies for public safety. And we are in the midst of a uh, debate, even though it's an August uh, recess here, of uh, how to solve this mass shooting and gun problem. And uh, actually, there's there are technology answers to this, I understand. Rick, uh, you have a, a new book called The End of Killing. Tell me about that. Yeah, basically, I think the way that we will solve this problem is the way we solve almost every problem, and that is through invention and new technologies that take us in a new direction. Ultimately, the way we will uh, reduce the use of shootings and, and lethality in America mm -hmm. is when we invest in newer technologies that give us the same benefits, namely the ability to protect ourselves, mm -hmm. but without the need to take someone else's life in the process. Um, yes, um, true. I guess my concern is the social end of it where the companies that are making tons of money off of, uh, gun sales won't relent to, uh, to, to technology <laughs> until they've squeezed every dime out of their own industry. Yep. Well, for sure. But you know, the, the thing about technological shifts is that, uh, when something better comes along, mm -hmm the market tends to move that direction regardless of, you know, what the old companies thought. The, yeah. There are a lot of companies pushing buggy whips and selling, you know, horse carriages in the early 1900s. That's true. But they got hit by a technology shift. And uh, today, you know, you might have a horse for a hobby, but it's no longer your primary means of transportation. Correct. Uh, I think there's a similar analogy here. Uh, when, you know, people that use uh, lethal force to protect themselves, mm. usually don't want to do it 
but it's the only really reliable technology today. Yeah. Um, I have a personal story where I had two friends that were shot and killed in a road rage incident by a man who used a gun to protect himself. Mm-hmm. He's now spending his life in prison, right. which is a pretty, uh, pretty bad outcome for him as well. I think had he had an option, and those options are, are being rapidly developed, uh, to use something else, he would have made that choice, as many people would. Yeah. I know that uh, tasers are, are one of the technological, uh, or stun guns, I guess is, is the, the layman term, uh, which have been quite popular uh, with uh, police officers and various uh, public safety institutions. Um, and I guess they need, uh, for, I, I, I watch the, the, all the, uh, the television shows, of course, there, Rick, and I see sometimes tasers work. If you're on some kind of a drug or something, you don't even know that you're being tased and you keep going. But I guess technology can bring us to a point where there are various strengths of tasers. Yeah, you know, uh, actually we've gotten to a point today where taser weapons, uh, they're not yet as reliable as a gun. Right. But they work perfectly well against mm-hmm. people on drugs right. uh, these days. The things where they aren't as reliable uh-huh. is if you miss, you do have to hit the, su- the subject with two darts. Right, right, right. Um, and it has to get through the clothing. So most of the time, if we see an ineffective use, right. it has something to do with <clears throat> either missing the target or uh, very heavy clothing. So those right. are the issues we're working on right now, how to make sure that we can always penetrate even the heaviest clothing. Yeah. Um, are there other technologies that, uh, that are in swing? You know, we are seeing things like uh, pepper sprays have become far more effective mm-hmm. in the past few decades. Uh, those, those are pretty popular both among police right. and uh, you know, private citizens. Um, I obviously uh, have a favorite in that I see electricity uh, as really the uniquely powerful technology mm-hmm. that can really challenge uh, the use of lethal force. In that yeah. <clears throat> electricity has some, uh, some properties that make it highly, highly effective. In mm-hmm. fact, uh, in laboratory conditions, Electric weapons today can actually outperform a gun. Right. Uh, it's just there's a few reliability issues that have to be dialed in yeah. before they can outperform police pistols in the field. Yeah. I mean, wasn't the whole idea of this uh, First Amendment thing to uh, to protect your, your home and in case the military comes after you with all their weapons that you can ward them off with your with your one uh, a gun? I mean, I... I, I, I I know these, these, these were musket days. Um, how do you feel about that whole thing? I, I'm, uh, people are saying that, hey, I enjoy shooting a gun. I like uh, possessing it. I like to shoot tin cans. I hunt. Um, these are all answers that they have why they would never give up their weapons. Yeah, you know, I, I think the approach that, that I'm taking here is I don't think people necessarily have to give up their weapons. Uh-huh. Um, but just like, you know, some people still ride horses, but yes. they're very infrequently used for transportation right, um, right, because right. newer technologies have come along. Yeah. So I, I think even people who enjoy going hunting, uh, I think social norms will shift to where the thing you take hunting is just not something that you would take out and use against another human right. being because we will have better weapons. They're starting to emerge already right. uh, that are much more appropriate and legally justifiable if you need to defend yourself. Um, is, is your, are you doing anything? I mean, I, I know you develop technologies, but is there also a, a cause or a fight uh, in order to pay the path for this? Uh, because, I mean, the ideas are incredible, uh, but, but we need to carve out a path in order to, to, to get to these things. Yeah, we're, we're pretty carefully trying to stay out of the, politics of the day Mm -hmm. in that, um, you know, we think great solutions can appeal to just about everybody. And we don't want to get sucked into the gun debate of today. We look at it and say, you know, the, the, the long-term solution is we need to invent our way out of this. And, uh, that doesn't require that anybody changes their political beliefs. If if you and I could go out and buy Captain Kirk's phaser from Star Trek, uh, most rational people would say, you know, I, I, I would get one of those to defend myself before I would use a normal pistol right. because I can protect myself and I don't have to take a life in the process and right. all of the legal issues that come with that. Yeah. 
But then there are those, like when we're talking about mass shootings, that that's with a purpose. It is, it is. But I, I think that's one of those where as people begin to, in their rational moments, make mm-hmm. different choices, okay. you'll begin to see uh, you know, less guns yeah. laying around readily yeah. accessible. Yeah. I'm I'm not too sure how much how much rational is is really out there to be honest with you. I think, <laughs> unfortunately, anyway, uh, the book is well, fast. There, there, yeah, go on. Uh, I was going to say, you know, it's more encouraging than you might think. Uh, right. There's a great book Hope. called "The Better Angels of Our Nature," written by Stephen Pinker, yes, I am who is a Harvard uh, yep. you know, uh, researcher who found that. You know, actually, the amount of violence in the world is already declining dramatically. Uh-huh. Like, it's down over 99% over the past couple hundred years. We just can't feel it that way because social media, the world is so true, connected. True. You know, if there's an That's act of violence that happens on the far side That's of the world, a very good point. we all see it. It feels very local. That's a very good point. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, in the 50s, for example, you never heard of nasty people, but it's because that was what the news was about. We weren't aware of all the nasty people. Now we are aware of somebody who just blows their nose incorrectly. Uh, I know we're getting short of time. It's called The End of Killing. Is there a website we can visit? Yep, uh, you can go to endofkilling.com, or the book is available on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and all the traditional booksellers. Very good. Uh, Rick, a pleasure speaking to you. Uh, and great, uh, great talking to you, and I hope you go real far with what you're doing. Thank you. Okay, well, we're optimistic that, uh, you know, Change will come. It always does. Excellent. The end of killing. Uh, Thank you so much, Rick Smith. Bye-bye. Well, that'll do it for today. You've been wonderful about this. You really have. You deserve some type of an award. Uh, I don't know what it would be called. The Award of Tolerance, perhaps? You know, I'll be back the next time another weekday rolls around with a brand new show. I hope you join me then right here. You know where to find me. Until then, I seriously wish you peace.